This is an anonymous box. This is an extremely rare post box. The factory suffered a fire in 1887. Hello, me old Pam. How you been? And welcome back to a thing of the past. Now, you know how we like to pick those hot topics, the stories that are on everybody's lips. So today is no different. Let's talk about post boxes. The postal service was started in 1516 by Henry VIII and for the first 100 years it was only the royal court who could use it. Nowadays there are over 115,000 post boxes in Britain. The sight of these are so common that we hardly notice them but they have become an iconic part of Britain's street furniture. If you look closely on every post box you will see the royal insignia or cipher, and this can tell us a lot about the locality in which the post box is situated. With this in mind, today we have a look at some of our local post boxes and unearth some of the secrets of the local area in which they have been placed. We hope you enjoy this episode. As industrialization and urbanization grew throughout the 19th century, the need for improved communications was established. In the 1840s, postal reform provided with universal affordable postage and new adhesive stamps, which made the prepayment of letters easier. However, in rural and outlying districts, people would have to catch the bellmen who came to collect their letters or take their letters to a receiving office, which sometimes could be miles away. A better way of depositing post was therefore required. The novelist Anthony Trollope, a general post office official, adopted a system used on the continent of placing locked cast iron pillar boxes at the roadside with the provision of regular collection times, and these became present in mainland Britain in 1853. Since these Victorian beginnings, Boxes have usually carried the insignia, or cipher, of the monarch reigning at the time of placement, unless the box was already in production at the time of the monarch's death. We start today here in Moor Lane on the east side of Loughborough with this excellent example of a Victorian pillar box. As you can see, it's in the iconic red colour. When the post boxes were first trialled in Jersey, they were in red, but in 1859, they started using green ones because some people saw them as an obtrusion to the local environment. However, this led to complaints that they were difficult to spot. And in 1874, all was standardized in red. And by 1884, the program of respraying had been completed. Because in the beginning, post boxes were the responsibility of a local surveyor, this led to a lot of different designs and therefore more expense for the post office. They therefore decided that standardisation was the way forward. The first thing that they standardised here is the aperture. Here we can see it's horizontal. In the beginning, vertical apertures had been trialled, but these let in the rain. What we can see here is a slight cap above the aperture to stop the rain, and eventually they would go with the standardised hood as well. For a while, a flap was trialled, but this was decided against. In 1859, the post office decided to standardise the whole box. However, local people were against this as they believed that the new design was not as pretty as the different designs that had been before. Especially in Liverpool, where the local surveyor commissioned his own box, the Liverpool Special, in 1862. By 1879, the Penfold box, which was hexagonal, had been push back against and they came up with this. This is a standardised box from 1879. You've got the hood, the horizontal aperture with the cap, you've got the royal cipher, Victoria, and you've got the black bottom. This would become the iconic post box of Britain. By the 1860s, this side of Loughborough was expanding rapidly with industrialisation. In 1860, on Factory Street to the south, 
A factory was bought by Nottingham-based manufacturers B. H. Hein, Mundella and Company to produce hosiery goods and powered knitting machines. They purchased the factory from Mr. William Cotton, who had a patent for an automated widening and narrowing device and a rotary frame, and these combined would eventually be known as Cotton's patent machines. Cotton had previously licensed patents to B. H. Hein, Mundella and Company. Mundella left to focus with great success on politics, and the Nottingham Hosiery Manufacturing Company purchased new premises here on Moor Lane. The first phase of buildings had a floor area of over 40,000 square feet and still room for expansion. This was compared to the 10,000 square feet only available at the Factory Street site. There was a five-storey mill building for hosiery production, as well as a two-storey factory for machine production, an engine house and boiler house. The factory suffered a fire in 1887 but production continued once it had been partly rebuilt and in 1892 the factory employed 400 internal staff with several hundred more in domestic or small workshops, so a huge employer in this area. The consecration of Holy Trinity Church took place on this road in October 1878 by the Bishop of Peterborough and this showed the growing need for religious institutions in this area of the town. On Littlemore Lane, a few streets to the east, an open-air swimming pool was built on the canal bank and was opened in June 1886. A substantial sized pool with a corrugated dressing hut that was open from May to September, it was hoped this would deter men and boys swimming in the canal and causing a nuisance and hazard to the many barges and boats using it. The water fed in from the canal through some sort of filter and drained out into a brook. It is therefore clear that a post box was required on the east side of the town as it bustled with workers from the factories and the Leicester navigation to its east. So we're now here on the south side of the town, not far from Queen's Park, with this very special box. This is an anonymous box. As you can see down here, there should have been a Victorian cipher. But between 1879 and 1887 at the Handyside Works in Derby, there was an error and no ciphers were included on the box. This is a very rare box. In the year 2000, there were only 300 of these boxes remaining. By the 1800s, the town was changing dramatically and there was continuing pressure to control the flooding of the Wood Brook, which ran to the northwest of this post box. In 1877, White's Directory described Loughborough as a thriving and rapidly expanding market and manufacturing town with new streets and building operations. Housing was being built both to the northeast and south of the church. The villas along Forest Road were built at around this time. Number one Forest Road was built in 1878. In 1880, T.C. Clark built the strict Baptist chapel on Forest Road, recorded as a Calvinist Baptist chapel in White Street Directory of 1888. With the Victorian terraces on Park Road and Beacon Road, it is clear this side of the town was increasingly in need of post-depositing facilities. Initially, in 1853, only roadside pillar boxes had been provided to towns. However, in 1857, a smaller box was created and provided to villages and rural communities, or where street lighting and pavements were minimal. This box was recessed into the cavity of a wall or attached to a lamppost, and this meant that it saved the post office money as they didn't have to create a full pillar box. Also, where population density was less, there was no need to have so much space for the letters. In 2021, the population of Snareston was recorded as being 318 people. In 1846, the population was recorded as being 408 people. At this time, the population was employed in a variety of sectors that were important to provide resources for the growing populations in urban centres. Agriculture was a large employer, 
with wheat and barley being the main crops, and bricks were also made in the village. Snareston Tunnel, part of the Ashby Canal, which, like the Charnwood Forest Canal, followed the contours of the earth and was lockless, opened in 1804. This provided transport for the collieries of Meesham and Moira. A mine shaft was sunk in Snareston itself in 1875, but this found only water. However, the other sectors we have mentioned showed that there were opportunities for employment in the village, and therefore, residents. So why put a post box here? It might be strange today considering that the majority of the village is concentrated to the southwest and this pub was known as an odd house for good reason. However, there are records of the Crown Inn going back to 1772 and in 1795 it was the only one of four pubs remaining in the village. Therefore, it became a centre of the community for the Victorian period. The Crown was also home to the Snareston Friendly Society. This was a sort of insurance that working men paid into so they had an income if they fell on hard times. Also, this road here to the left of me was the Burton-on-Trent to Market Bosworth Turnpike Road, which meant that as the pub may have been used as a coaching inn, there was also a need for a post box there. On top of that, of course, being on the main route meant that it was easy for the postman to collect the mail at the end of the day. By the end of the century, less than a month before Queen Victoria's death, there were over 33,500 post boxes in Britain. Edward VII reigned for nine years from 1901 to 1910, but in this time the postal service continued to expand and a new cipher was also produced. The Royal College of Arms work with the monarch to design a cipher and Edward went with the classical looking one. Here we can see the E with the R in between. The E for Edward, the R for Rex, Rex being Latin for King. This cipher was seen in many places during Edward's reign. The military used it, it was used on buildings and it was used on documents. Unlike Victoria's cipher, we can see above it, on the post box, is included a crown. Burstall was traditionally a small village. In 1851, the census said that the population was 491 people. By the 1901 census, it expanded to over 600 people. It was due to this census that it was decided the village should have a post box. A description of occupations in 1901 showed that the old staple forms of wage earning, such as farm labouring, framework knitting and domestic service, were no longer the only option for the working man and woman. 27 males were agricultural labourers, just over 4%, whereas 50 years earlier, 12% were labourers. Only one framework knitter remained, whilst 50 years earlier, there were 67. The new century saw a growing variety and in independence in employment. 45 people were employed in shoe manufacturing, there were 11 teachers, 12 market gardeners, 6 of them owning their own business, 6 managers, 4 commercial travellers and 4 engineers or machine minders. With an increasingly independently employed population, the need for easier communications for these businesses was clear. The positioning of the post box here puts it in the heart of the old village, in between two pubs. The old plough, which presumably catered for the agricultural workers, and the white horse, which it is known was catering for the workforces on the old Grand Union Canal from at least the 1790s. We're now here on Leicester Road, opposite Southfields Park, with this George V pillar box. As you can see, a great example of the directional top. This, the barber shop, was once the post office. Wow. So as you walked along here, you would have seen the sign and then where to drop your letters. If we look down here, we can see for George's cipher, he went for a much simpler design on post boxes. The letters aren't interwoven and there's no George V for the fit. 
Also, George V reigned from 1910 to 1936, which means this is quite a popular post box. They account for about 15% of all post boxes. The positioning of this post box shows how the focus of areas developed with the introduction of transport. Of course, this road has some buildings which predate George V's reign. Some of the buildings were developed in the Georgian and early Victorian period, and the building in front of Southfields Park was built in the early 1800s and owned by the Paget family. However, at that time, Moore Lane, where we started our journey today with the Victorian pillar box, two streets to the north, had a huge footfall of people going to work at the factory, visiting the church, or walking into the town from the canal, and vice versa. In the 1930s, however, as cars grew in popularity, Leicester Road was classified as the trunk road from London to Inverness as part of a scheme for numbering the roads in the country. Now, cars and buses would pass along this route to and from Leicester and the outlying villages. This shows how the changing of a town meant that a newer post box was required in close vicinity to the last one. A turbulent period for the monarchy followed the death of George V in 1936, as his son, King Edward VIII, reigned for only 326 days. He showed impatience with court protocol and caused consternation amongst politicians by his apparent disregard for established constitutional conventions. His proposal to marry Wallace Simpson caused a constitutional crisis due to her status as being divorced from one living husband and in the process of divorcing another, which was considered an unacceptable status for a prospective queen consort. Edward was also titular head of the state church, which, at the time, disapproved of remarriage after divorce if a former spouse was still alive. This would have caused the government to resign, forcing a general election and ruining his status as a politically neutral constitutional monarch. Despite Edward VIII's extremely short reign, a new cipher was created and this began to appear on vehicles and on post boxes. As we can see, it was an amalgamation of his great grandmother Victoria, his grandfather Edward and his father George's ciphers. He kept the ornate font, but the letters are separated out and his number, the eighth, is in the middle. As with his grandfather and his father, the crown is included above. This is an extremely rare post box. Less than 200 were produced and only 171 remain today. There is one example that is in the Postal Museum and the only other one in Leicestershire is in Earl Shilton. During the interwar period, Colville continued to develop southwards towards Hugglescote. Factory employment increased dramatically. For example, between 1914 and 1926, Matterson's Loom Factory saw its workforce increase from four to five men to about 25. Clutsum and Kemp's Manufacturing and Weaving Company employed several hundred people in this period, and their eight-acre factory occupied land between Highfield Street and Beaver Road, hence affecting the population in this area. By 1937, the company site had expanded to eight times the size the factory had been in 1908. The need for amenities and entertainments in this growing area were clear. In 1927, the Greyhound track opened just up the road, and in the 1930s, the Miners' Welfare Association built the public baths on Avenue Road. It was clear that this area needed a post box. So we're now here on Beacon Road in the Shelforth area of Loughborough with this lovely George VI fox. Now, although George VI reigned for 15 years, six of those years were during the Second World War. And of course, at that time, iron production was focused on the war effort. As you can see, from the cipher, he didn't go with the simple design that his father had used, which was the bold print without the numerals. He went with a more traditional style, close to that of his great grandmother and his grandfather, Edward. Until the middle of the 19th century, Loughborough had only manorial courts to govern it. 
and these proved inadequate to cope with the necessities of drainage and pure water, the lack of which caused an abnormally high death rate. The Board of Health, established in 1850, inaugurated improvements, but expansion and due to requests for improvements by ratepayers, led to the Crown granting a charter of incorporation to Loughborough in 1888. This established an elected council which took over the responsibilities of all the boards known as the Loughborough Corporation. The Shelthorpe Estate was started by the Loughborough Corporation in 1926 and was developed on the principles laid down by the Tudor Walters Report of 1918, which was influenced by the Garden City Movement and Arts and Crafts Housing Design. Up to 1914, Barry Parker had worked in partnership with Raymond Unwin as architect and planner respectively. As major advocates of the Garden City movement, they established a national reputation for designing new housing schemes which incorporated careful groups of dwellings in well-treed and landscape settings. They used small crescents and cul-de-sacs to achieve high standards of amenity and picturesque townscapes. These designs were seen as a reaction against the uniform grids of streets of earlier Victorian terraced housing. In 1902, they had designed a new social housing scheme for the Joseph Roundtree Trust at New Earswick Garden Village in Yorkshire, and in 1906 to 1910, they designed the Hampstead Garden Suburb. The original plans for the Shelthorpe Estate were rejected by the Ministry of Health as being too expensive. But such was Councillor Moss's determination to develop a high-quality scheme that he appealed to local businesses for financial support. Tuckers and Son Brickmakers, for example, contributed £1,000 towards the construction costs of Shelfort Road. Tuckers and Herbert Morris Limited had a progressive attitude to the treatment of their workers. They received substantial nomination rights for the houses, and Herbert Morris Limited focused on the education of their workers, becoming in 1919 the first company in Loughborough to introduce a formal system of day release apprenticeship in association with Loughborough College. The Bull's Head Public House, now a McDonald's restaurant, is typical of the large roadhouse pubs built by the breweries during the interwar period. These improved public houses were a feature of many outer suburbs and were intended to exert a more civilising influence on both the patrons and the neighbourhood than the older Victorian street corner pubs. As is clear, the development of Shelthorpe in the 1920s and 1930s led to the need for a post box and under George VI this was given. So we come to our final post box of today. This is the Elizabeth II lamp box. There's plenty of choice when it comes to Elizabeth II post boxes because over 60% of all of the ones in the UK carry her cipher. This lamp box was probably put here for supplementary reasons, maybe in line with the 2011 Postal Act that Ofcom enforced on the Royal Mail that means that a post box must be within half a mile of 98% of UK addresses. We've chosen this design because it's one that we've not covered yet, but also because, ironically, it's attached to the telephone pole, which, in the end, would bring about regular postal communication dwindling out. As we have seen through this journey, street furniture that we pass by every day without a second thought, with a little digging, can tell us incredible details about our surroundings. The hosiery industry, which was once a key employer in Leicestershire, could initiate whole areas rising from the ground up. Now, with many of these factories and houses gone, it is reassuring to know that one feature of these times remains to give us a glance into a thing of the past. <laughs>